I believe that we as individuals always have to stand up for ourselves if possible. And we need to role play how to do that. Mm -hmm. And then I would like to get this on the record. If you choose to report somebody in your organization, don't let them shut you up. Yeah. You have to tell more than one person because they the first response is almost always to cover it up and make it go away. Hello and welcome to A New Angle. I'm your host, Justin Angle, Associate Professor of Marketing here at the University of Montana College of Business. This podcast is my chance to talk with innovative thinkers, both savvy vets and up and coming stars in the Montana business ecosystem. My goal with these conversations is to dig deep into how these people think, to understand how they view the world and conceptualize the opportunities it presents. Let's go. Hello and welcome back. Thanks for tuning in. This is an exciting time for this podcast. Our first two episodes were fairly well received. We appreciate all the encouragement. And for all of you who've listened to those episodes, thank you for listening. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your suggestions. And if any of you have any ideas as to how we can make this uh, enterprise better, don't hesitate to reach out. You can email me at anewangle at umontana.edu. I look forward to hearing from you. Along those lines, the early days of a podcast are super important for getting the podcast an audience. So if you're willing, we encourage you to share the podcast. We encourage you to rate it, to review it, and to subscribe on whatever platform on which you're listening. Those things are important in this world that's driven more and more by algorithms. So if you're so inclined to share and rate, review, please do so. And along those lines, a new angle is pleased to announce, actually, we're more than pleased, we're totally stoked to announce that we have a first sponsor. Consolidated Electrical Distributors has stepped up as the first sponsor of this podcast, and we are overjoyed. That's going to give us great opportunities to improve the show, to improve the sound quality, to get better guests, all those things to improve the experience for you. So thanks so much to CED. A little bit about CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors, is one of the largest electrical wholesale supply companies in the country with nearly 600 locations nationwide. CED is a privately owned business-to-business wholesale company that distributes just about every piece of equipment that keeps your lights on, your energy flowing, and your lifestyle comfortable. Now, CED has been a huge supporter of the University of Montana and the College of Business. In fact, they've hired many of our students, and those students go through CED's tremendous training program. If you're interested in learning more, go to www.cedcareers.com and check out some of the amazing opportunities there. So thank you to CED. Glad to have you on board. Now, shifting gears here to today's topic, you know, we we had to shift up the schedule a bit. I was scheduled to have... uh, new UM president Seth Bodnar on today, Um, but we pushed that one back um, because the recent news uh, that struck our community this week made us rethink our schedule. So what I'm referring to is the news of the soccer coaches firing here at the University of Montana and uh, the subsequent bad behavior uh, associated with that, specifically bad behavior in terms of sexual misconduct. This problem is just so rampant in our workplace. The stories just don't seem to be stopping. You know, we had the story of Steve Wynn, uh, the casino magnate. Uh, the news of his his bad behavior w- was prominent in the media in the last few weeks. And then the Larry Nassar um, scandal at Michigan State University. You know, when this was going on in the in the fall semester with Al Franken, with Harvey Weinstein, Uh, and the many others, we felt compelled here to explore the topic as best we could in the podcast. We felt like we felt we had a responsibility to delve into this topic. It's not a topic I feel comfortable talking about. Uh, I'm not trained in it. Um, I'm not an expert, but I do feel that as a business educator, I have a responsibility to explore ways where, where we can do better, where we can educate our people better. And so I recorded an episode or an interview last fall with Jackie Moore and Suzanne Tillman, two trusted, valued colleagues here at the University of Montana College of Business. And we had some difficulty kind of getting into it and trying to figure out, uh, find our way through and explore what our responsibilities are as business educators. 
So it was a tough conversation. We tried to make some progress. And I just felt like it was important to get this episode out there to our audience now in light of the, in light of the stories hitting our community. It was timely. Like I said, we do our best to explore the issue. I'm not sure if we made any progress, but we tried. So without any further ado, I give you Professors Jackie Moore and Suzanne Tillman. So I'm here today with Professor Stan Tillman and Professor Jackie Moore, two close colleagues and dear friends. Thank you both for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you for asking. Yeah, so today is a little bit different. It's a difficult topic, um, one that uh, the three of us have talked about at length that we're not particularly comfortable talking about, and that's the issue of sexual harassment, sexual misconduct in and out of the workplace, prominently by men in positions of power. And um, if we're uncomfortable talking about it, students, people trying to get ahead as young workers in the workplace, they have to be really struggling. So I think we as business educators need to wade into this, not wade into this topic, lean into this topic, be leaders, and figure out how to do things better. I don't have the answers. I don't really have a strong sense of how best to talk about it, but uh, I wanted to start out by engaging both of you. We're sitting here on a Thursday afternoon. The news of Al Franken retiring or resigning from the Senate has just dropped, which is kind of an appropriate backdrop for this conversation. I guess first off, it's easy for me to sort of be shocked at a lot of the news. And then I start to think like, is that shock appropriate? And I thought I'd start off with that. Like, do you find this spate of stories in the media, prominent, mostly men. Is it shocking or is this, uh, how do you respond to it? I think it is shocking in the fact that something is finally happening. Okay. That is the shock to me because this has been going on for generations. I can recall my days working in Silicon Valley 30 years ago where the gender-based harassment and bias and discrimination was just part of the culture there. And here we are 30 years later, and finally people are talking about it. But we know in the tech companies that the bro culture is something that has continued to be scrutinized. We're seeing highly visible celebrities and politicians finally taking accountability for this, I would like to see the same level of accountability in the workplace where the conversations have not been as, I don't know what the right word is, uh, above the table, uh, you know, on the table. Um, It's still a hidden part of the culture. Right, right. I'm surprised at the attention it's receiving and the reaction. A lot of that, though, is due to the quality of reporting that was done around these Mm individuals because the reporters didn't come forward with the name of one accuser. They came forward with the name of 12 accusers with with repeated patterns of behavior that made the individual accuser credible, which is sad. That's a great point, Suzanne. As, as Jackie was talking about her experience, you know, it makes me wonder, like, what about the instances of a supervisor acting inappropriately? And he's not a person that's going to show up on the media. I don't want to say nobody cares, but it's not going to be a front page story. You know, those are the sorts of people that need to get the message in, in a big way, I would I agree. And that's why at least large organizations have human resource departments that are set up in the organizational structure as a lateral branch. However, we also know that what 90% of the employees in the United States work for small and medium sized businesses uh, that don't have dedicated human resource uh, professionals to help navigate that or have a place to report it. And so I think that's more difficult. Okay. The other thing that I find is interesting and difficult about this is how hard it is to talk about. Yes. And I think that there are a couple reasons for that difficulty. One is that sometimes people don't even know they're acting inappropriately or inoffensively because they don't see the problem. And When you have this sort of tacit sanctioning of behavior that makes some other class of people uncomfortable, it's really hard to surface because people get defensive very quickly. 
And they start to say, well, that's not what I meant. And we get back to this issue where what you intend is different than the way that it's received. And we see this in interpersonal communication all the time, regardless of whether or not it's about a loaded topic like gender-based discrimination or harassment. And so what I've tried to do in some of my conversations with some of the groups I've had is um, I've used an article called What I Learned About White Privilege by Riding My Bike. Mm -hmm. And so when we speak in terms of implicit bias based on the way our culture has developed its norms for operating, and I'd say that this gender-based issue is somewhat based in that, but it goes beyond that as well. Um, It helps to put the ability to talk about it in a different realm than accusing all men of somehow being clueless, Mm -hmm. um, which sometimes it comes off that way. Another thing that I've done in my classes is try to support the issue with facts and statistics. So, for example, we know about the gender-based inequity and how little women make compared to men in comparable positions, and we know there's lots of explanations for why that disparity exists, but the fact is it doesn't explain all the disparity. And so if we look at something like Sheryl Sandberg's lovely TED Talk that she gave that cites quite a bit of data in her book, it provides a forum for conversations that take us away from the he said, she said, and into surfacing some of the cultural and sociological phenomenon that I think are part of the root cause of of the issue. It, It makes me wonder about, so not all situations are the same, not all people are the same, yet we have to develop better policy and practices. I'm curious about like where our society, and in particular higher education, is failing in addressing this. We're supposed to be preparing the next generation of business leaders. And if this behavior persists, we are not delivering on it. And right now, like, I don't think this, this never gets explicitly addressed in the curriculum. I had an awkward opportunity to wade into it in class yesterday, and it was a powerful moment that, and that moment sort of made me realize that, wow, there are giant gaps in what we're preparing our students to do. Gaps that are more important than anything I'm covering in marketing. And how do we do better? I I don't know where it lives in our curriculum. I don't know um, best practices. uh, I want to learn. I'll just throw that out there. Like, where do you think, I mean, discussions obviously matter, but where do you think we start in trying to address this? Well, I think we're very fortunate that we we are paired within the liberal arts curriculum at the University of Montana. So I don't think that the need to address all of this is within the business curriculum, but we do require our students to take half of their classes outside of the business school to develop their thinking and their empathy and their worldview and their critical decision processes in addition to what we do at the business school. What we do at the business school is we have changed our curriculum to require ethics to be offered within our business curriculum. And I know with my own personal interest in environmental sustainability, we added that as a unit within business ethics to make sure every single student at least had it addressed once. Right. Right. And so this discussion encourages me, and I hadn't thought about that, to talk to our instructors in business ethics about making sure we have a piece of that curriculum that addresses disparities and reflection on how we treat people of different classes, not yeah. just gender. Yeah, and then that begs the question, like, does it live in the ethics course or is it somehow does it somehow have to be elevated to be a part of all courses or you know, a thread throughout the program? I think there needs to be a multi-pronged solution and Um, For example, Justin, I know that you're an expert in the implicit association tests. And I have heard on NPR, for example, that some medical schools are administering the IAT to residents before they're fledged as doctors to really Mm -hmm. surface, do they treat men differently than women when they come in with similar symptoms? And the data show that they do. Um, Same with different uh, ethnicities. And so perhaps we could have a Friday workshop where we as faculty take an implicit association test, which I think would be really great role modeling for the students. And to perhaps then ask students if they want to participate in something like that. 
I also know that Suzanne did lead a book club a number of years ago. And I have done book clubs in my class, and the students get to pick the books. Okay. And one semester, uh, several teams picked Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In. Mm-hmm. And the men who picked that book wanted to understand the women's experience better. And so I call this kind of the, um, I don't know if this is the right way to say it, but the enlightened male perspective is, let me have empathy for what that experience is for you so that I can be part of the solution from knowing the experience as opposed to having good motives, but not really understanding it. And so I think there are a bunch of different avenues that we could use to tackle this. And I think the key thing, Justin, is what you're suggesting, which is to have the courage to at least broach the topic. Right. And I would expect that it shows up in business law from the legal perspective. And I would expect that it shows up in organizational management theory or the organizational behavior class, at least in some piece. But I like your challenge to the faculty to address what our implicit biases are and then to look at how we are addressing it and kind of threading it in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've thought about that notion of implicit bias or blind spot, and and it, it can work in multiple ways here. And one way that I certainly bring my own biases to the table that that operate outside of my awareness. But one thing I think about in this context is a bit of a blind spot to behavior. Now, maybe there's behaviors that occur in a faculty meeting, some setting where there's lots of us, and and I don't even see it that somebody else is acting. Or maybe it's something I've done that I don't realize. Maybe it's something a colleague's done that you find offensive that I don't even notice. Or maybe just by virtue of good fortune, I haven't witnessed this type of misbehavior directly. And so I have this notion in my head, like, how on earth do these people, like Matt Lauer, how is, does he not know how to be a human being? Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. what on earth, how, like, where do you go in your life where you, what path do you follow that leads you to think that it's okay to, like, bring a young intern into your room and lock the door? Where does that system fail? I mean, you can't start out on day one thinking that's an okay idea. Mm-hmm. And so is it some like constant series of reinforced bad behaviors that with no consequence that lead to that? I don't know. I don't know how that works. And I've never really seen it. So it, it's that forms another type of bias in terms of this blind spot. Like I just mm-hmm. don't understand that behavior. Well, I think that's an egregious example. And obviously... Yeah. Matt Lauer had power within his organization for decades, Mm -hmm. so I'm sure it was an eroding situation where not getting called on the small things so that it keeps stepping up. And it's it's an entertainment where I think there's a lot of people who are knocking on the door trying to get in, and so there's some real consequences to speaking up, especially if you don't see any only detriment Mm -hmm. if you do it. I hope none of our students are ever in that situation. To me, that's such an extreme example. I think our students are more likely going to be in that, exposed to these gray areas. Was that harassment or not? And what do I do about it? And who do I talk to? And should I be offended? Or is this just normal work behavior? But I think those are way more difficult, at least for me, even when I was 20, than having somebody lock a door on me and touch me. If somebody truly touched me, there'd be something to group to to complain about. Right, right. But it's the, the eroding of your legitimacy in the organization um, and the jokes that are have many, many slices that I think are more common and harder to address. And I would suppose if you don't sort of play along with those cultural norms, you miss out on opportunities. It can, depends on the organization, yeah, yeah. right? And, and how central the protagonist, sure. antagonist, Better word. <laughs> Antagonist <laughs> is, right? Um, so some antagonists, you can give them the cold shoulder and everyone will support you because they have very little structural power in the organization. And nobody really wants to encourage the jerk. Nobody's going to get in his way either. Right. And it's just the little things, right? Leaning over you, putting his arm on the back of your chair, trying to get you to sign documents that maybe make you look like an ass, like you don't know what you're doing, right? So... Those are those little things. You, you can sometimes give somebody like that a cold shoulder, but then sometimes you you report somebody and it turns out they maybe they didn't look like they had a lot of capital in the organization, but they have a lot of social capital in the organization and it backfires. Mm-hmm. So um, I think those are much more difficult to navigate. 
And in that regard, I feel like we could do a better job of having scenarios where our students actually do some role playing in these different kinds of contexts, because it's like interviewing for a job. The first time that happens to you, you're stunned and speechless and you have nothing ready to deal with the situation. But like interviewing for a job, the more that you practice, anticipate, understand kind of what the options are, it empowers you to have a response in your repertoire. So I do think we could be doing more in that regard. I just think it's so interesting, though, to talk about the norms that have built up over time, whether it's with respect to um, gender equity issues or um, sexual orientation, for example, so much of our structures in society were developed with bias, and it's very hard to unravel those. Um, and just being aware of them, I think, is the first step. So trying to generate that awareness of, of what those structures are. And we, I mean, we study norms in the business mm -hmm. school, mm -hmm. some of us with our academic research, and when we talk about it in, in probably various organizational behavior classes that they get covered. You know, maybe that's a spot where you know, at least the treatment of it needs to lead, live in the curriculum. But it seems like a more explicit acknowledgement of how calcified these norms are. I mean, awareness is one thing, but then you gotta have motivations to change the way things operate now. Sure. And it's a tough area in which to create motivation, like there's not explicit rewards to coming out. In many ways, coming out is horrifying as well. I mean, I, I would imagine, I'm totally speculating here, right? That that's, again, my, my personal blind spot. I've never been in that scenario, but it's got to be horrifying to, to, to speak out. I think, very little upside. Right. Other than being able to live your truth. Yeah. What's really important, though, and I think in whether it's, and I've read a little bit about, you know, coming out, um, but some of it applies to trying to speak out against um, gender bias or actions in the workplace is you have to have a network. You mm -hmm. have to have people you can talk to, people you trust. I can say from personal experience, the two situations where it went poorly for me, I did not have a network in the organization. Okay. I did not have a person to bounce the idea off of, to discuss what was going on, to give me some insight onto the or into the organization and the power structure in the organization. And if there was a history there or not. And so I think it's really important that um, you have to understand your context and you have to have a network to be resilient and to really be effective and figure out. And it's really hard when you're first coming into the workplace to know, is this normal or is this not? Because this could be your very first professional job. Right? And maybe, for example, you're in sales. Right? And is, you know, are how they behave in sales different than how they behave in auditing? And so trying to figure out the situation requires connecting with people. Yeah, and that's a really interesting point, Suzanne, because so often in business school, we talk about networks, personal networks, in terms of using them to get a job, create opportunity. And this is a different take. So maybe there's an opportunity we could frame the importance of social networks. They're sort of a form of, they're not quite power, they're not quite social capital, but it's a form of legitimacy of a sort in an organization that's critical not only to creating opportunities but protecting yourself and giving yourself sort of cultural legitimacy when something is wrong absolutely wrong. and in understanding whether or not it's a norm in your profession right so is this just this organization i'm working for or is it uh, just this uh, supervisor yeah, i'm working yeah. for or is all of my friends who are doing this type of job in other organizations do they have the same conditions? Um, and so I think that's very important in trying to figure out, one, how to react, and two, how to address it. Now, there are things that are egregious, and I completely agree with you, Jackie. We should role play. I, I believe the same thing for sales, because you're going to get into all kinds of ethical situations in sales, and you don't want to be put on the spot. You want to know how you respond to them. Right? And I, I would agree. You know, how do you respond when... Somebody invites you to dinner and you show up and it's only the two of you. Right? And you thought it was a team meeting. Awkward. Or, right. <laughs> or yeah. how do you respond when you're traveling and the desk 
person announces your room number and you're a solo woman standing at the desk and there's a group of men who seem like they're here for a good time standing right behind you. So you practice. Think, you say, you need to give me another room and you need to write the number down. And then there's all the stigma associated with taking a stand for yourself, which is, you know, something mm-hmm. else. And I don't know if this is true for everybody or women, but so many times women feel like they have to be people pleasers. And so to stand up for yourself actually is something that is very difficult, um, which, again, it's a, it's a societal issue that we need to work on. I think from um, another solution-oriented perspective, I think it's quite interesting the number of organizations, at least in Missoula, that exist to help women find their voice, articulate their voice, be um, a network of sorts to bounce those ideas off of. So for Example, we have the Women's Foundation of Montana that has a group called Powerhouse Montana, which is women who are available to network with other women on any issue that might be of interest to them. Um, I know that uh, the Blackstone Launchpads Pursue Your Passions is designed to help women entrepreneurs in particular get out of the uh, environment of Shark Tank, which has been developed much more around the male culture to help encourage women to start their own businesses. And the Women Who Get Shit Done group has had a little bit of controversy when um, men started showing up to that. Mm. And the whole idea behind it was those men really want to understand what do women do that is different when they're just with women compared to when they're with men. And surprisingly, there is just a different sense of the way women interact as a network compared to when there are men present. Mm. And so I think just observing and wanting to be part of understanding is is what I keep coming back to. And certainly that doesn't address the systemic issues, but at least it's a start. I know for me, just having this conversation makes me think already, okay, well, here's three other things that maybe we could be doing to help our students feel more comfortable in talking about this and addressing it. Um, such as having a women's panel where we actually just ask them to do some role playing, for example, where sure. people and can I will that. say men get predated on as well. Yes, yes. I yeah, know, I, I that, know but... that when I was doing one of my internships, a male intern in the same office was getting harassed as well. Yeah, and the data show that you know people, uh, you know, non-gender conforming individuals and. Uh, homosexual individuals encounter even more of it. So mm-hmm. there are it, it does come in all forms. But a women's panel, a panel with men included, mm-hmm. you know, it is, it's hard to, I understand exactly what you're saying. I came up with Pursue Your Passions. You want enlightened men involved <laughs> or, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, open to the discussion. Right, right. Rather than the defensiveness, the, the insistence that, the women or are already trying to say isn't working. Right. You don't want defenders of that worldview. It makes it harder to make the conversation move forward. And I, I always go back to also so much of this is rooted in how children are raised, what is normalized in their house. I was shocked once when one of my son's friends brought a Playboy magazine over. It's like, no, that doesn't fly in our house. And so I was going to call his parents and talk to him. And I was told very quickly, that's normal in his house. I don't think you want to take that battle on. And um, so some of this, you know, when you get back to the Mount Lauer, how did it escalate to that point? I always go back to what were the norms in that household? Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's really important we tell our women that no means no. I think for men, they need to know that no means no, too. And they're as entitled to say no as a woman is. Um, yes. Yes. I would. Ex- I mean, I think we need to tell our boys and girls. Like, it's got to, I mean, my daughters are five and six and almost eight now. And I think we're maybe too late. Like, we got to, we talk a lot about, you know, you make your choices with your body. And, and But I think we need to be more explicit. And I've been trying to read more and learn more about this. But yes, yep. it has to be. I mean, that's, that's kind of like the foundation of this. I and suppose. I've said to my son, you know, we always tell our boys, you need to respect what a woman says. And then I say to my son, you have the right to say no if somebody's being aggressive to you. Yes. Um, well, and that uh, ties into something uh, 
and talking about strategies with for our students, either if they're interning or they're going out into the workplace. I have had people reach out to me that when they've been in an uncomfortable situation, and my, I always ask, what did you do to address this? Right? Because I know there's a lot of fear, but they have you have to stand up for yourself. Okay. Right. You have to, I mean, maybe you are in a situation where you can't or you're frozen and that's different, but to repeatedly go into a situation where you're uncomfortable and have never said anything to that person directly, I think makes it very difficult to then go to another person in the organization. I mean, you can if it feels very dangerous, but many times these are small slights yeah. that build up over time. And Chances are the person doing it doesn't even realize it, right? And if you can, if we can practice ways mm-hmm. to let the person you're dealing with know that, you know, that makes me feel uncomfortable because it implies that I'm not as competent mm-hmm. as a man. Many times they'll stop. It, it's just, like, I didn't know. And then they might get a little sensitive and weird around you for a while. But I, I mean, we do. But that means the person's learning and processing, I suppose. Yeah. So, and I know that there's in many cases that doesn't work. In many cases, if a person's really being aggressed on, the 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 fear response yeah. makes it impossible to address directly what's happening. Um, but the things that have my students, ninety percent of the things my students have talked to me about, are more minor slights that build up over time, that and the side comments and. I believe that we as individuals always have to stand up for ourselves if possible. And we need to role play how to do that. Mm -hmm. And then I would like to get this on the record. If you choose to report somebody in your organization, don't let them shut you up. You have to tell more than one person because they, the first response is almost always to cover it up and make it go away. And if, and then once you've reported it once, your career is already, your neck is already out. Your career is already getting looked at. And so once you choose, you got to keep saying it to enough people that doesn't get covered up as much as you possibly can. Yeah, it would seem we need better policies to allow that better sort of better norms. In many ways, like, you know, there is a power structure that is, that disfavors the victim Mm -hmm. It does in a way. There's so many disincentives to coming out. And we have to move toward a system where, I mean, we have this sort of justice ethic of innocent until proven guilty, but I think that might be failing us in this instance. There's so many reasons why we should believe the victim. The data overwhelmingly support the fact that victims are telling the truth. And to me, like that has to be built into the system we use to evaluate these, these instances. And my hope is that, you know, if we circle back to where we started, you know, this problem has been so entrenched in society and business and government and all sorts of contextual domains for so many years that... I think talking about it alone is insufficient. Um, And I don't know where the right way to address norms and the systemic issues, where that lies. But what I really hope is we get to a point where the dialogue has moved into redressing other types of issues because this one has been around for so long I want to be hopeful as opposed to not hopeful that in 30 more years we're still going to be having the same conversation about gender equity and imbalance and hopefully we can be dealing with poverty and equity and you know access to health care and things that it seems that as a society we should be, the gender conversation should be moot at some point because we need to be addressing these other, I don't want to say more important issues, but I just keep hoping the gender conversation at some point will be addressed. 
I don't know if I'm saying that very well. No, I get what you're saying. You're sort of implying like if it's true that the what if it was it the arc of history bends toward justice. Is that, I don't know if that's quite this the. That sounds this, nice. This, okay. Well, I didn't coin that term. <laughs> uh, but if you believe that, then you would. That implies that at some point the conversation's done. I mean, I think constant vigilance. Things might improve, certainly in a nonlinear way. But I think that maybe to ensure that the conversation gets more complete, that we have to have constant vigilance. Yeah, but maybe if we get to a point where we have 50% women in government leadership and 50% yeah. women in business leadership, and we have 50% men at home helping raise the children, and maybe we'll get to a point as a society where those norms have changed. And as a result, certainly we might always have um, gender dynamics that come into play. But my hope is that by having more balanced numbers, that perhaps the, the whole structure of the system will shift. I like that. And then when we see these behaviors, it's really about power and not about an underlying worldview. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, probably time for us to bring this chapter of the conversation to a close. Uh, I just can't thank you both enough for your willingness to engage in this conversation, your willingness to talk about it in general. And I know when we initially thought, thought about the idea of having this conversation, we all mentioned that we were uncomfortable, that we're not experts, but that doesn't mean it's not worth talking about. If we're uncomfortable, Think of the young student, think of the young woman trying to make her way in, in the workforce, and we got to serve that constituency better. Any, any final parting shots or, or words of wisdom? No, I thank you for your courage in being willing to tackle this, so I think that's great. Agreed. Well, I don't know if we've tackled it, but we're, we're trying. So thanks a lot, and uh, we'll see you down the road. Well, there you have it. We did our best to tackle a difficult and important issue. And we're going to do more of that here on the podcast. We'd love to hear your thoughts on how we're doing and what we can do to make it better. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And remember that this episode of A New Angle was brought to you by CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors. They're our first sponsor, and we can't thank them enough. CED is an important employer in our community, and they have a keen interest in University of Montana graduates. To explore career opportunities, please check out www.cedcareers.com. Some exciting things coming up here on the pod. Next week, we have new University of President Seth Bodnar. After that, we'll release a conversation with Missoula Mayor John Engen. If you have any suggestions for guests, cool people doing awesome things in and around Missoula, please let us know. And if you enjoy this podcast, there are many ways you can support it. First, please rate us on iTunes. Ratings help others find the podcast. Secondly, write a review. The more reviews we get, hopefully positive, the more we can grow the show. Third, just tell your friends about it. In addition, you can also support A New Angle financially. For information on sponsorship opportunities, please visit our website, www.business.umt.edu slash a new angle. There you will also find a link to support the pod. Before we go, I would like to thank a few folks for making this project happen. First, my colleagues here at the College of Business for supporting this endeavor. In particular, Professor Josh Herbold for writing and recording original music for the show. We also have music provided by Switchback Records, a student-run record label here at the college. And many thanks to my producer, Stefan Borsom. Finally, if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, insults, whatever, please email me at a new angle at umontana.edu. Help us spread the word, and when you do, be sure to use the hashtag a new angle. Thanks a lot, and see you next time. All right, special bonus for those of you that tuned in all the way to the end. I am here with Ainsley Angle. Ainsley, thanks for coming on the podcast. I'm glad to be here. You're glad to be here. So lots of things we could talk about, Ainsley. First of all, and what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be a veterinarian. A veterinarian. Why do you want to be a veterinarian? Because I care about animals and I don't like them getting hurt. That's a great answer, Ainsley. Where do you want to live when you grow up? In Missoula. In Missoula? At your mommy and daddy's house? Yeah. Okay. And is it important to treat people with kindness? Yes. Why is that important? 
Because you want people to like you for the way you act. That's a very good answer. Thanks, Ainsley. It was a pleasure having you on the podcast. You got to say thank you now or something. You're welcome. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Your favorite. Ainsley wanted to redo, so we are back. You asked me to ask you what animals are your favorite. So, Ainsley, what animals are your favorite? Uh, chickens, pandas, seals, um, owls, and um, I... And dogs. So kittens and pandas. You have a kitten that looks like a panda. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Is that who, what's that cat's name? Crookshanks. Crookshanks. Where's the Crookshanks name come from? From Harry Potter, and you're the one who's reading it. That's right. What book are we on? Um, book six. I mean, yeah, we finished it. It's on seven. Seven, and is seven the last book? Yeah. Oh my goodness. What are we gonna do when we finish Harry Potter? Uh, watch all the movies. Watch all the movies again? That's a pretty good idea.